Um, we have been looking at Nehemiah, been talking about his holy ambition, and Nehemiah's holy ambition involved a wall. And, and we've been going, uh, looking at holy ambition in, in this wall that Nehemiah was involved in. Uh, I thought I might need some help. Uh, Randy volunteered to use his mighty tumors to help me here. But I think, I think I might be able to carry these stones over here and place them on the wall. I'm an old wall builder from way back. But we started off with Nehemiah having a dislocated heart. A dislocated heart. And, and we talked about dislocated heart. A dislocated heart is, is essentially being touched by what someone else is going through. Uh, in fact, recognizing that the world does not just revolve around me, but there are other people, and, and my heart should ache for them. And, and so Nehemiah had a dislocated heart. And then the next week we talked about Nehemiah having a broken spirit. Now, the interesting thing about Nehemiah's broken spirit is that he spent 40 days in prayer. 40 days in prayer because of his broken spirit. He he talked to the Lord. He recognized his sinfulness, and he also recognized that his only help, his only hope was the Lord and the strength that the Lord gives. By the way, as an aside, we're still praying. It's been 14 days as of this morning. Every morning, 6 a.m. here at the, at, the, at the auditorium right here in this spot, we've been praying. Uh, anybody who wants to participate in that, come on out. We've still got however many, 30, 26 days left, 26 days left, so come on out for that. But that's a broken spirit. The next week we talked about Nehemiah having a faith. And if you remember, he went before the king and he was risking his life in order to... Those limestone rocks sound like styrofoam to me. But he's risking his life to come before the king and, and ask for resources and ask for time off and, and ask to be able to go and build the wall. He, he displayed a tremendous faith. The following week we talked about Vision, vision. Nehemiah eventually gets to Jerusalem after getting the king to give him all that he needs. And when he gets to Jerusalem, he essentially casts a vision for all the people that were living in Jerusalem. He, he let them know, we got something we got to do. I can see what God can do here. I can see the finished wall, and you need to see it too. What can we be, he asked them. And, and they all bought into his vision. And then last week... We talked about commitment. Man, my back is wearing out on these. Commitment. And Nehemiah essentially encouraged great commitment on the building of the wall. And if you remember last week, we talked about how all those that were involved in the building of the wall, all of them did it with all of their heart, it said. They, they had given all of their heart. They would not be stopped they would not be thwarted. Now, we're getting a pretty good wall built here. And you would think, by this time for Nehemiah, and by this time in our lives, that, hey, things should be going downhill from this point. I mean, we should be getting some momentum. Things should be going on the right step. We've seen our vision start to come together. We've seen that trusting God always pays off. We've seen that working with all our hearts is the way to get things done. And you would think, that from here on out, everything would be smooth. Everything would get done. But you would be wrong. I want you to listen to what Jesus tells us <coughs> and what his disciples tell us this morning. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Now Jesus says it like that. Now his disciple John in 1 John chapter 3 verse 13 says this, Do not be surprised, my, my brothers, if the world hates you. And then Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8 says it like this, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I want you to understand, in your Christian walk, as you live out your faith, things do not get easier. When we finally start doing God's will, stepping out far with Him, 
things almost always get harder. That is, in fact, why this last attribute is critical for any Christian who is looking to be used by God, who is striving for holy ambition, and that is that we must have courage. When we finally get to the place where you are ready to walk by faith and live committedly to Christ, then I want you to understand the attacks are going to come and you and I are going to have to live courageous lives. Now earlier this year, you may recall the trouble a Christian couple faced because <coughs> they were committed to their faith. Aaron and Melissa Klein owned a bakery in Oregon. It was called Sweet Cakes by Melissa. They specialized in wedding cakes. One day, a same-sex couple asked them if they would bake them a wedding cake, and Aaron and Melissa declined. Now, they did it politely. In fact, they suggested other bakeries that would willingly accommodate this couple, but the couple were offended and took their grievances public. And as a result, uh, everything has been changed for Aaron and Melissa. They have been verbally attacked. They have been robbed. They have been boycotted. They lost a large portion of their business. And as of this past week, they finally had to close their doors. Now I want you to listen to an interview that was done this past week with Melissa, the owner of the baker that had to close its doors. She said this, It is so worth it just to sit back and watch how God provides for you. I struggled in the past with trust and even with my faith in God. But through this, my faith has grown. My trust has grown dr tremendously. Yes, I have lost something I worked really hard for and lots of years put into. But I know that really doesn't matter. My eternal home is what matters. I'm, I'm not going to bring all that with me. I'm happy and okay, and I'm being provided for. If you are living your life with holy ambition, if you are committed to your faith and you have caught a vision, if you are ready to no longer just sit by and watch the helpless perish, but you are going to get involved, then you must accept one fact. You will be attacked. You will be attacked. Now, I'd like you to turn with me to Nehemiah. Turn with me back to Nehemiah. We're going to look at some texts we actually looked at last week, but I'm going to look at them a little different this morning because they're important for us to see what happens when we live our lives in the pursuit of holy ambition. Uh, the first thing we need to know before we read our text, the first thing we need to know is that holy ambition attracts ridicule. Holy ambition attracts ridicule. Let me read to you. Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> when Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and, and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those Heaps of rubble burned as they are. And then Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What are they building? If even a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stones. I want you to understand, Nehemiah and the Jews are doing what God had instructed them to do. They, they had had a vision. They're trying to, to serve God, and immediately they receive ridicule. When you walk in holy ambition, the first attack is almost always ridicule or criticism. People are just going to say, oh, you can't do that. What are you thinking? This is doomed to fail. Do you think you're better than everyone else to be able to accomplish those things? Now, you might think that ridicule and criticism really doesn't have much effect on a Christian. You know, we all think of the old song, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's an absolute falsehood. False. Words do hurt people. Words have real power over us. Did you know that 
when asked, people reported that the number one reason that they didn't share their faith in Christ with others is because they were afraid of being ridiculed. They were afraid of being ridiculed. When I was in junior high, and in high school for that matter, ridicule was a huge motivator for me. I remember it was my first year at a new school in a new state, and the very first day I had people making fun of me. They made fun of my clothes. They made fun of my, my shoes. They made fun of my haircut, which now they still do, but nonetheless, they made fun of all those things. That motivated me. I went out and I got a job. I, I did a paper route, and I mowed yards. I did all these extra jobs, and I made a deal with mom and dad. Whatever money they would spend on jeans or shoes or anything, give it to me. I'll add on what money I want, and I'll buy the brands that won't make me ridiculed in school. It made a huge difference in my life. I, I mean, I worked and spent all my money on clothes and, and shoes and stuff that really doesn't matter that much but it affected me. Now, you might think the attacks of ridicule is a junior high problem, but that's not true. Adults have honed this skill. We know how to use these attacks on other people very effectively. In fact, even in our nation, we, we decide what we're going to do uh, based of completely upon opinion polls. What, what do people want most? Sometimes even in the church, on opinion polls, we decide what is most effective for the Lord. We're always worried about being politically correct. They're always trying to get us to conform to what they want us to be. And I just want to warn you right now, right at the beginning, right off the bat, if you are ready to step out in holy ambition, grab hold of the vision God has for you and commit to it with all of your heart, I just want you to understand, you are going to be ridiculed. In first, or excuse me, in John chapter fifteen, verse twenty. John chapter fifteen, verse twenty. This is what we are told. It says, "Remember the words I spoke to you: No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you, also. We're going to be ridiculed." Now, if that weren't enough, there, there are some other attacks to holy ambition. And the second attack is this. Holy ambition is tested by discouragement. Now, I want to jump back into Nehemiah before I explain that to you. Nehemiah chapter, 10 verses, uh, Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. It says, Meanwhile, the people of Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemy said, Before they know it, or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. The first attack is ridicule, but, but the second attack kind of springs from ridicule because I think ridicule plants these seeds of doubt and the second attack comes from the inside out and it is this feeling of being overwhelmed and, and over our heads and it leads us to discouragement. Satan is right there. Every time you decide you're going to do something great for God, he'll try to ridicule you through others. But then his next step is to just continue to plant these little seeds of doubt and whisper in your ear, this is too big for you. You're shooting too high with this goal. It's going to take someone who's better, who's bigger, who's more able to accomplish what you're shooting for. I want you to think about these Jews at this point, that they were over halfway done with the wall. And it was after they had gotten far along that they started to get discouraged. Discouragement gained a foothold in their lives and it began to squeeze in on their hearts and their soul. This attack can take many, many forms. But one of the biggest forms I've seen it, even in my own life, take is the form of burnout. We, we say things like this, I've done it for so long, there's nothing more I can get. There's nothing more I can do. It's just discouragement masking itself in this term, burnout. By the way, burnout, I'd rather burn up for the Lord than be lazy in the kingdom. Nonetheless, 
before I hurt my calf, I, I was finally running, you know, six plus miles every day. Not, not every day, but different days. I want to tell you something about running. I'd get out and I'd start here and I'd go over there, hit uh, King Springs Road, run down and hit, uh, not King Springs, Day Buck Road, run down and hit King Springs Road. But anyway, I'd run. Within the first half a mile, my mind was telling me, you need to stop. You need to stop, and you need to stop now. My, your legs are killing you. You need to stop. You need to stop. But I learned a secret. If you make it past the first mile, things kind of get a little better. But then I'm going to tell you another little truth that happens. About the second mile or third mile, mind says, you need to stop. You've gone far enough. You need to stop. Now You would think you push past that. You'd be home free. No. Fifth mile comes. You need to stop. This is craziness. You need to stop. You need to stop. Right there's McDonald's. Stop here and get a milkshake. Every moment, every mile, it was, you need to stop, in my head, you need to stop, and I just had to keep saying, no, I don't, I can keep going, I can keep going, I can keep going. Sometimes we are our worst enemies. Even in this family of faith, it is easy to get discouraged. And the truth about discouragement is, when it grows in your heart, it has a habit of growing in others, too. Your friends, people down the pew from you, people in the Sunday school class with you. It has, it has this tendency to, to gain momentum in our lives. In Romans chapter 7, verse 24, Paul, in this very transparent verse, says this. Romans 7, 24, he says, What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body? of death. Paul looked out and essentially expressed discouragement. I'm struggling with discouragement. Now he goes on to say that Christ had rescued him and what great news that is. But so often we get caught in the discouragement. How do we maintain a courageous soul in the face of of these attacks, in the face of ridicule and criticism, and in the face of discouragement. How do we continue to live as courageous Christians doing our work of holy ambition? Well, I want to spend the rest of the sermon talking about that. It's important to know what attacks are going to come, but it's more important to know how you're going to overcome them. And the first thing we need to recognize is that you maintain holy ambition by praying. It's just a simple thing. You maintain a holy ambition by praying. Nehemiah 4, verses 8 and 9, right in the midst of the attacks, this is what it says. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against us, but we prayed to God. We prayed. We prayed. Nehemiah is amazing to me. This man never stops praying. When in trouble, he prays. When criticized, he prays. When discouragement came, he prayed. Now you might think, yeah, but he's an anomaly. No. He's just one of many that have prayed. In fact, Jesus, God in the flesh, our example for life, prays. He prays when he is overwhelmed with discouragement. I want you to listen to what he does. Mark chapter 14, he is overwhelmed. Jesus is overwhelmed. And in Mark chapter 14, <coughs> verse 34 and 35, Mark chapter 14, verse 34 and 35, this is what he says. It says, my soul, Jesus says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. And then verse 35, going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. He prayed. Jesus prayed. Have you ever looked back at your week and you thought to yourself, oh, I wonder when the last time I really prayed was. Now, I, I, praying before a meal is an important thing. Don't get me wrong. That is great. Pray before a meal, that's important. But, but when has your prayer life been deeper than just that? Have you ever thought back and thought, boy, I haven't prayed in three days. I haven't prayed in five days. I didn't pray this whole week. When we stop praying, 
we essentially have chosen to sever our connection with the supreme power that God has on our behalf. We've essentially said, I'm cutting off the connection to the one guy who can provide all that I need. Just not going to talk to him. Not going to ask him for help. I'm going to stop. Try to get it done on my own. So the first thing we need to do to maintain holy ambition is pray. The second thing we need to do to maintain holy ambition is to rejoice in past victories. We need to rejoice in past victories. These people amaze me. They are half, they've got half of the wall, over half the wall done. And it is at that point that they get discouraged. They should have rejoiced. We're over halfway there. We can see the finish line. God has been able to provide for us. Let's go. Let's go. But they get discouraged because they take their eyes off of what has been going on in their life. Think about all the victories God has given us, given you. We're debt free as a congregation. Well, not, not everybody in the congregation necessarily, but as a church, we're, we're debt free. We got new facilities over there, and we got some new facilities that are not too old over here. We've got huge events that, that have really touched people's lives and, in fact, brought people to the Lord. We've had personal decisions where people given themselves to God completely and then just continued to shoot down the road to commitment farther and farther. There are great things to rejoice in and so often we take our eyes off the victories and we only look at the attacks. I'm reminded of what Paul says in Romans chapter 8 verses 31 and 32. Romans chapter 8 verses 31 and 32. This is what Paul tells us. He says, <coughs> what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? We need to remember to look back at the victories God has given us and celebrate them. And then the last way to overcome these attacks <clears throat> is that you maintain your holy ambition by fighting the good fight. By fighting the good fight. You just keep fighting. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 9. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. They prayed, but they also got ready to fight. They refused to be intimidated, to be stopped. They, they kept on fighting. You can ask my mom. One of the best ways to get me to do something as a child, one of the best motivations you could ever have is to tell me you can't do that. You tell me I can't do that, then I'm going to try to do that. Satan is telling you, you can't do that. You can't reach those people. You can't have that any kind of influence. You can't change your community. They are going to be full of drugs. They're going to be full of all this kind of sin. They're going to be full of people that are hopeless. And you can't change it. And I am here to tell you, you can change it. You can change it. If you will just stand up and fight. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Sometimes we just have to fight for what God wants us to be. To never give up. To always push through and just push away the ridicule and the discouragement for God. See, I want you to understand something this morning. I believe that God has laid a holy ambition on each and every one of our lives. I believe he has something in store for us that is so magnificent if we will just step out and trust him. I believe he's touched every single one of our hearts with something or someone or a group of someones that we can get involved in, that we can help for God. If we will walk by faith, if we will keep our commitment serving him, if we will catch a hold of that vision, if we will be broken in our spirit and recognize our power comes from him and if we'll be courageous and never ever ever give up 
The challenge is to have the courage to continue even when the attacks come, and they will come. Do you have that courage this morning? Do you have the courage to live a life of holy ambition? Only you can decide. I want to end the sermon by reading you one last text. It's found in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, I want to read this to you. We're going to close with this. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 through 4. This is what we're told. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for Nehemiah. I thank you for their courage. I thank you for them standing up and saying, we will fight. We will finish. Even in the face of ridicule and criticism, even in the face of discouragement, they said, we'll not give up. We're going to pray. We're going to fight. We're going to struggle. We're going to do whatever it takes to continue to push forward. Lord, I pray for each one here. Lord, I know that you have great things in store for each of our lives. If we will just hold on to you with great courage and refuse to give in. Lord, I pray for us as a congregation. I pray that we will grab hold of that holy ambition, that vision that you have uh, for us of what we can be through you. Let's grab hold of it and let us shoot for it. Let us abandon ourselves to it and to you. Thank you, God, for all that you provided. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.